एवरीवन ग्रीटिंग्स एंड वेलकम टू द फोर्टी एथ सेशन ऑफ द ऑनलाइन ऑप्टॉम लर्निंग सीरीज लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस टू यू आवर स्पीकर फॉर टुडे टुडे वी हैव मिसेस मेरिकी एंड शी इज एन ऑप्टोमेट्रिस्ट शी हैज कंप्लीटेड हर बैचलर्स डिग्री इन ऑप्टोमेट्री फ्रॉम साउथ अफ्रीका इन टू she also holds a post graduate diploma in diagnostic and advanced contact lenses to neco usa in 2012 she has also a post graduate certification in ocular therapeutics through sunny university us uh, since 2017 and she is licensed to use and prescribe ocular therapeutic drugs as and when needed her special interests are in ocular surface diseases and pathologies specialty contact lenses as well as dry eye management she is also the author of a book named vision studs practical guide for anterior segment condition which is available on amazon so she has been speakers at various local optometry conferences at webinars as well as numerous online webinars she is also currently in uh, i mean she has already developed uh, something online for training which is known as the guru mat which is a new and exciting international learning platform which brings practical eye care training for all of you so today she is going to talk to us about dry eye management how to get started what's the practical side of dry eye and thank you very much first of all uh, for for taking up your time and doing this for us and i would now hand over the screen time to you Thank you very much, and thank you for that um, great introduction. I always, uh, I always find it quite um, intimidating when uh, my CV is uh, kind of presented that way. It sounds quite hectic, but yeah, thank you so much for the warm uh, welcome, and thank you guys for having me. I think this has been such a great blessing for me to be able to. um also have a conversation on a platform like this i think um the double o ls is doing an incredible job um to provide uh, some great necessary training uh, you know for the indian um country and it's it's just a privilege for me to be a part of it so yeah i'm excited to share with you guys today um and i'm going to skip let me just get into these slides because i also had this up here but it was covered quite um quite greatly so you guys are welcome to go onto amazon and have a look um at this book one of the biggest questions i always get regarding this book is the fact that um you might not be licensed to prescribe um that is not a reason not to read this book i really feel that as optometrists and as primary care providers we should have the information and we should know what the best form of treatment is for our patients in any shape or form even if we cannot prescribe it ourselves we should be in control of our patient's management so through this book you have a us and african based um training um Uh, training structure or training uh, 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 management structure and also drops what drops are available in those two countries and i found that it's very um useful in most countries across the world and it gives you a good idea of how to diagnose these conditions and also how to manage them so it runs all the way through uh, lids and lashes conjunctiva corneal traumatic injuries and then there's also quite a big section on dry eye as well So yeah feel free to go on to Amazon and get a copy there hard copies unfortunately only available from me I am able to post them out of the country but yeah you know the post system is very um difficult to trust so I really would suggest to go and get the Kindle form for that and then like you guys heard the guru mate platform I will talk a little bit more about this at the end because I have a little bit of a present available for you guys when we finish um and then we'll share the link for you to that but uh, this platform has just been able to to for me to give more practical training so we do a lot of video based training on how to actually do these procedures and that's a big part of what i want to talk to you guys about today because there's so many webinars around giving you um clinical information giving you these um you know technical stuff but no one really gets to actually show the practicality about it and how to go about making this work in your practice and i see we've got quite a lot of students online as well even as a student you need to start thinking more in the lines of how am i actually going to make this work 
and less about you know the theory behind how it works so that's what i want to share with you guys today and then um let me get to the next slide there we go and then i heard you guys had a great session yesterday on um, computers so it's great that this is going to tie up so nicely all right so all that said and done let's get into it so why dry eye management i mean there's so much so much talk of, on dry eye i mean i think dry eye has been covered in all its shapes and forms but like I said, for me, dry eye management is much more of a practical thing than it is a theoretical thing. And in optometry, unfortunately, it has become more of a theoretical um, knowledge base and people are not actually taking that into their practices and making a difference in the patient's lives. And if you look at the statistics, studies show that up to 30% of people worldwide suffer with dry eye symptoms. I actually recently read a study that said that the symptomatic dry eye can be as high as 80%. Now, if you, if you look at those st st statistics, that is incredibly high. I mean, just on 30%, you're going to have one in every three patients that has some sort of dry eye problem. And I bet you it is going to increase now specifically because of this computer problem. Now, if we look at this little Timmy Turner character here with his little red eyes, this has really become a very big problem in eye care. And, it's, and now with COVID having all of us on lockdown, we are spending so much more time on computers. Look at what we're doing now. This was not something that was done six months ago. But here we're sitting almost uh, 15 hours apart on opposite sides of the planet. And we're sitting on the computer having a discussion. So um, video usage and computer usage although it has been able to cross bridges and cross countries, it is definitely causing some visual symptoms that um, is something that we as optometrists should have a very, very um, big uh, part in managing. And a very big part of the computer problems is dry eye related. So you have this decrease in blink rate, which is probably the biggest effect that computer has your blink rate decreases, which means that your ocular surface will dry out quicker. And these people will end up coming in with these gritty, um, sensitive red eyes and not understand what it is that's happening. Also, this is going to become a much younger problem. Dry eye used to be an elderly patient issue, and it's no longer the case. You are going to see young people children, um, adolescents, teenagers with this problem because they are the ones that are spending most of the time on some form of electronic device. And you have to be sure that you check this out and make sure to actually manage it properly. Okay, so let's make it practical. Let's see how are we going to actually get this part of our business. And the part that I actually want to discuss with you guys today is how to just start incorporating some form of dry eye um, and in this case screening procedures to get your patient into this whole uh, dry eye uh, kind of train that you want to teach them to go into okay so i have broken dry eye management up and it's very important that you don't make everything part of your comprehensive exam we have to start breaking it up and making sure the patient understands that what you are going to give them is over and above a normal examination, right? But for now, I want to just show you how this will all fit together. So the patient will come in for a comprehensive exam and they might show some of the symptoms, you know, the grittiness, the little bit of, uh, you know, paining red eyes. And what you will do at that stage is you will do a dry eye screening. Now, the dry eye screening consists of three things, a questionnaire, the tear breakup uh, measurement and the staining patterns. And we're going to go into this in great detail just now. Right. So that is what you do during your comprehensive exam. Now you have established that the patient has got some form of dry eye symptom or they are a dry eye suspect. And at that stage, you will refer them into what I refer to as the dry eye workup. The dry eye workup is the next step in your system. And in the dry eye workup, you will do a complete diagnostic assessment. Now, this diagnostic assessment makes up about 10 or 15 extra tests that you will do to be able to classify that person in the type of dry eye that they might have. Because if you don't have that, 
it's very difficult to treat them. Once you've finished your dry eye assessment or your dry eye workup, you've now been able to establish what type of dry eye problem they have. And at that stage, you then refer them into the dry eye clinic, which is your treatment plan or your treatment space. This is where you will then conduct their treatment, whether it's in office or whether it's home treatment, whatever you, you decide to do, that is done within the dry eye clinic structure. Okay, so let's just recap on that. Comprehensive exam, you do a screening, then you refer them if they are positive in their screening or they have a, they've become a dry eye suspect, you refer them into a dry eye workup. This is a separate consult, okay? And this is very, very important because optometrist has always kind of just done stuff as part of the comprehensive exam and the public doesn't, um, they, they don't put value onto the extra test and the extra equipment that you have. And it's very important to separate these things to justify when you are actually going to charge them extra. And that is a conversation for a whole nother day. And I know all of us have a big issue when it comes to the charging side of things. But this is really, really very important, guys, that you separate these two things. You do a screening during your comprehensive exam, but that is all. And then you refer them into the dry eye workup where you will then do everything else and diagnose them fully. And then from there, you will work out their treatment plan. So I want to go through how this dry eye screening system works so that you guys can start this straight from tomorrow. You can walk into the office and you can say, okay, let's start screening people. Let's find out how many of our patients are actually dry eye suspects, All right? And this is what you are going to do. So the first step is a lifestyle questionnaire. Now lifestyle questionnaires are there to determine how much of an effect the patient's symptoms have on their lifestyle, on their quality of life, for that matter. How much are these symptoms actually going to affect the way they perform their daily tasks? And um, how, how much is it going to actually make them uncomfortable? You know, how, how motivated are they going to be to actually do something about this All right so there's three different ones that i've got on the screen here the first one is the deq5 the deq5 is probably the most comprehensive it's a little bit longer as well then you get the speed questionnaire which is the one in the middle and then the one on the right is the osdi now in terms of research it's normally the deq5 and the osdi that's used the speed questionnaire is not very um, explanatory. So I would probably not use that anymore. I used it normally as a screening tool, but it really doesn't give you enough value for you to, to benefit from it. So I would actually omit that one completely. Personally, I use the OSDI, which is the one on the right. You can actually get that online. You can just download it from Google. And um, it's comprehensive enough so that you can know exactly what's going on with your patient and you can monitor these symptoms that way as well. So the first thing you do when the patient comes in for their comprehensive consult is you get them to fill out an OSDI questionnaire so that you can see how much of these symptoms is playing a role in their quality of life. Because these people are learning to live with it. They're learning to kind of say, oh, well, you know, I've had these burning eyes like forever or my eyes have just always been watery. I just I've learned to live with it. And they sometimes don't even realize that it's something that can be managed and there is actually something we can do about it. So this questionnaire allows you to establish how much of those symptoms are present, number one, and how it's affecting their lifestyle. Right, so once you've finished um, your questionnaire, you'll move over to the next step. Something I wanna add here while I'm there is that um, a lot of the software now includes the, the questionnaires and um, you can also get these questionnaires in app format. So when you go onto your cell phone and you go into apps, you will see that you can actually download an OSDE, OSDI app, okay? I'm just waiting for the slide to go over, you'll see it now. So you get an OSDE, OSDI app for Android and you also get an OSD app for Apple. So please feel free if you want to, um, do it, sorry, I just want to make sure the screen is working because I see it's not going over. There we go. 
All right, so it'll go over on your side now. So something that works really well is um, on a practice phone. So we, for instance, have a practice cell phone and we've downloaded the app on our cell phone. And instead of printing it out on paper, you can actually give the patient the cell phone and let them fill in the OSDI electronically. It helps with paper saving and um, with the younger patients, it's quite fun. Um, on the left hand side, that's the one for English version for Android and then the dry eye OSDI questionnaire for Apple. The only problem with this is, is that you cannot um, uh, print it out normally and it, you'll have to save over. So the once the, the, the next patient comes, it'll actually just um, wipe out the previous patient's information. So you're going to have to write it down anyway. So, but that's a nice way of doing a screening in practice as well. So once you're done with your lifestyle questionnaire, the next step is your breakup, your tear breakup. So remember we said three steps, your questionnaire, your tear breakup, and your staining patterns. Okay, so the second step is your tear breakup. You are going to do a slit lamp evaluation with your patient in a normal consult anyway. So while you're busy with that patient, you're putting fluorescein in that eye, you are just going to spend a little bit more time on checking your tear breakup time and also just checking your staining pattern. Now, just for recap sake and for the student's sake that's on the platform, with the tear breakup time, you put fluorescein into the eye. You allow it just to absorb for a little bit of time, get the patient to blink once or twice, and then you count in your head until you see the first patch of black area breakthrough on the cornea. This is where the tears have evaporated. So let me take the drawing tool here. Uh, there we go. And this is a patch of breakup, okay? And here as well, so like I said, just for the students here, so I can just show you. On this side, you'll see there's a patch there, okay? And that one there, okay? So you are actually going to note when it actually um, breaks up the first time, and that is your tear breakup time for that specific patient. And um, it's important that you actually um, note the first breakup. So you want to count in your head the moment the first black spot appears, that is your um, tear breakup time. Now, this is still an invasive breakup time because it's done with fluorescein, but it is sufficient enough for a screening procedure. When you're doing your workup, you will want to do a non-invasive tear breakup but this is sufficient to determine what your breakup time is um, for uh, screening purposes, determining whether the patient has got dry eye symptoms or not. Okay, so that's your second step, looking at uh, tear breakup. Then the third step is your staining patterns. Now, staining patterns are quite simple because all you do is once you are in um, the fluorescein doing your tear breakup time, fluorescein is already in the eye. So now you can just check your staining patterns as well. Now, in this case, I want to just stop a moment and talk about norms. Um, and that's something that I will um, show you guys later on because I've got a little tool for you for that. But norms is very important. On your tear breakup time with fluorescein breakup, if you get about a five second on fluorescein breakup, that's actually quite good. The same with staining. You've got norms on staining. And the norms for staining patterns is as follows. On corneal fluorescein staining, anything more than five corneal spots is regarded as abnormal. And on conjunctival staining, anything more than nine conjunctival spots is regarded as abnormal. Now, if you look at this picture on the right-hand side, and that was something I always had a bit of a struggle with, because if you look at this picture on the right, it looks like quite a lot of spots if you had to put them together, but then you have all these big patches as well. So let me just draw it over here. So that to me is a patch, okay? Now, how do you determine if that's a patch or a spot and how are you counting these spots? Now, according to how I understand it, is that a corneal spot is the same size as an epithelial cell. So only these little spots that you see in between here those are regarded as spots. The moment they coalesce like this, it is no longer a spot, but a patch. And that is a huge amount of spots put together. And when you look at the norms, you'll see what I mean with that. And this um, actual uh, system or this staining pattern that you have on this picture on the right is actually quite severe. 
um, this patient has severe corneal staining and falls within the highest grade of corneal staining. Then on the left hand side, we're talking about conjunctival staining. Conjunctival staining is done with lysamine green. And remember, this is still done in your comprehensive exam. So this is the only thing that you might have to add that you haven't been doing up to this point. You want to add lysamine staining as part of your general consult. So once you finish with your fluorescein stain, you'll insert your lysamine stain. You have to put quite a lot in there. You have to let it settle for some time. Also be careful not to touch your lysamine strip to the bulba conjunctiva because as with this picture on the left, that was actually not a staining patch, but that was a touch of the strip to the conch. So when you touch it, it'll actually show like a staining patch when it isn't. So what you do is you actually install it in the lateral canthus. You make sure you put it right in the corner of the eye so that it doesn't create um, uh, false false staining patterns as well right and then the third thing you check with your lysamine stain is your lid stain as well because it can have a lid wiper stain as well okay so just to recap on this slide specifically is you have the corneal staining with fluorescein spots more than five will be um, abnormal then you have your conjunctival staining which is done with lysamine green anything more than nine spots and then you can also have a lid wiper stain, um, which is, a, is the size, I think, is about more than two millimeters. Then that is abnormal. Okay. So that is the three steps and the complete um, screening procedure that you will basically take your patients through. All right. Like I said, your symptomology. And here you can see, let me go through this uh, chart quickly with you. This is a chart that was formulated in the DUCE 2 study. And here in the middle, you will see this is exactly what we are talking about now. We are talking about the screening um, uh, tests that we do, the symptomology questionnaire, your tear breakup time, and your ocular surface staining. I have left out osmolarity, which is included on this, um, this actual uh, slide here. The reason for that is, is that I have found that most optometry practices across the world don't have access to an osmometer. And it is not a necessity to have one. So you don't have to go and outlay that money to buy an osmometer. You can actually just use what you have and, and go with that. So I haven't included osmolarity for that purpose. I would, it would be great to know if you guys have access to that. But even in South Africa, there's no one in South Africa that's currently using um, osmolarity testing in their practices. So that is why I have just excluded it. OK, so let's just bring it back in terms of the bigger picture. We said during your general consult, you will now include these three screening procedures that's mentioned here. Right. Once you've done that, if the patient tests outside of norms, for any two of these three procedures. So let me just say that again. If the patient tests outside of norms for any two of these three procedures, then they are classified as a dry eye suspect. So for instance, they, um, they did an OSDI questionnaire and you'll see here the norm says 13. So you, they did an OSDI questionnaire and their value is 50, five zero. You did a uh, tear breakup time and the tear breakup time is two seconds, but they've got no ocular surface staining. So they've got, um, and uh, they failed the symptomology, they failed the tear breakup time, but they passed the staining patterns. But then they have actually, um, they are classified as a dry eye suspect because they have failed two out of the three um, tests or screening tests that you have performed. Right. Then from there, you are going to talk to them. You're going to show them exactly everything you've done. You are going to educate them on what you have found. And you are then going to say to them, good, I want to now send you to a dry eye workup where we are going to go through a whole batch of tests. And I'm going to run you through a whole batch of tests to determine where the problem lies. Because you cannot treat someone if you don't know what type of dry eye problem they have. Okay. Then my question always is, why do we do this? We asked that in the first slide. Why dry eye management? And this is why. So 
a colleague of mine in the United States always says that it's not rare until it's in your chair. This little boy um, is a 12-year-old boy who ended up in my office after he had an episode of uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is, a, is an autoimmune condition or a hypersensitivity reaction where uh, the skin actually, um, the, 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 the epithelium desquamates off, off, of the, off, of off of the body. So the skin just peels off of the body and it dries up all sebaceous glands. It is incredibly painful and many of these patients don't survive the acute attack because there's so much swelling and inflammation throughout the mouth and the, the, the bronchial pipes that they normally suffocate and they, they actually die from this condition. So with him, he actually did survive, but the sequelae and the, the complications after an episode like this is very extensive. And um, by the time he got to me, he'd already lost his left eye due to a perforating ulcer purely from a trichiasis. So the bottom lid started, because of the scarring that formed, the bottom lid started to curl in, the eyelashes were scratching, and it formed a perforating ulcer. And he lost the left eye uh, very quickly. The right eye, we are managing very difficultly because with this condition, with um, no tear production because all of the glands dry up. So he's got no aqueous fluid whatsoever. So there's this constant friction and he's got a corneal scar and yeah, we're trying to manage him um, as best we can and putting him onto a scleral lens as a bandage lens to try and uh, protect that right eye at this stage. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is the things that dry eye can, this is, this is, this is what dry eye can become. This is the conditions that is associated with dry eye disease that a lot of people don't even think about. This little boy was not ocularly managed in the hospital. He was managed for a systemic illness. So by the time he got to me, his ocular symptoms were excessive, purely because his medical team did not think about the secondary reactions that um, this condition actually had on his eyes. So we as primary care providers play an enormous role when it comes to actually helping these type of cases. And we are qualified and we are capable and we are able to actually do this. Yes, there's limitations and yes, there's things that we cannot prescribe, but we are very much in the position and in the capacity to be able to deal with these things um, adequately. And with him, uh, we were very lucky after two months um, of care. Um, his vision was very bad when he came to me initially. He was like uh, 660, which is 2200, I think. Um, and after two months, um, his, the, the clouding and the scarring had subsided quite a bit. And um, what it was quite a big um, highlight of my career was he actually came in for his checkup and with this little note and he was able to see well enough that he could actually write me this note thanking us uh, for his care so so this is why we do this guys and this is why i i do this this is why i've got a passion for teaching this and i've got a passion for getting you as optometrists to believe that this is things that you can do to believe that we as primary care providers are in the right place that we can actually change people's lives and we are not there to one or two every day. We are there to actually manage ocular surface problems and change people's lives to such an extent that they can actually function again. And I know even um, in South Africa, and I think India is very much the same, being a third world country, there are so many people that really, really need our help and people that depend on us to be able to help them when uh, the government systems and the primary care facilities are not. Not able to do so. Right. So the, the actual quizzy for too long. But this is a resource that I compiled a little bit earlier this year. And I found that um, I was like, 
having to go through all the textbooks constantly to try and find the norms and read through all the studies. So this is a great uh, guide to grading. So what it does is it takes every test and it shows you exactly how the test works and how to grade your results. Um, international grading standards is very important. We need to be able to compare apples to apples. So if we ever have a conversation about a patient and we do a case presentation, we need to make sure that we are on the same page when it comes to our grading and our norms. So please, this is, um, this is an absolute free ebook. The link is on there. Um, maybe if someone can just copy it into the, into the chat box, that would be great. I'll do it just now. Um, so you guys can really go in there and go and download your free copy. Um, if you do it on a tablet, you can have it available in the office, but you can download some PDF so you can always just um, save it to your computer and look at it at a later stage. This is really going to help you in terms of diagnosing and in terms of making sure that your norms and everything is correct. And um, just as an example, I wanted to show you kind of what it looks like. So this is if you're looking at tear meniscus height, for instance. Um, it shows you what a normal, a low, and a very low tear meniscus height value is, and then also a very high. So it all depends on the test that you're doing. Um, it'll have a little bit of an explanation of how to do the test, and then also what your norms are for that specific test. So please feel free. This is available at the moment. You guys can go and um, just uh, get into the website, download it, and go for it. All right, so that is me, the practical side of dry eye management. I really hope you guys found it um, valuable and interesting. Um, I think the main the main thought I want to leave you with, um, and and I had a discussion earlier in the week, um, you know, with the guys about uh, your your scope and how the scope works in India and all of that. But this is a, a global problem. Every country in the world, except for America, has got a scope issue when it comes to optometry it's important that we start changing the way that we think because we think that we are not capable of these things because our country has not given given us the scope but just because you cannot prescribe doesn't mean you cannot um, be actively part of your patient's management for years i was telling other practitioners what to do with my patients because at the end of the day they are coming back to me for treatment now I'm in a place where I can do it myself, but I've built so many relationships with my general practitioners and with my ophthalmologists that I can literally pick up a phone and ask them for whatever, and they are very much likely to support me in that. So knowledge is key. You have to know what you're doing and you have to take charge of your patient's care because at the end of the day, we are not going to look after these people. No one is. So please, guys, you know, have the have the guts to step out of that space and um, and let's get up to a place where you guys can also you know extend your scope and and get to yeah, where your patients deserve you to be at so that's me what questions do we have okay thank you thank you so much for uh, for the very insightful talk uh, and let's just move to some questions what we have ma'am first uh, no in the meantime, yep. so the first question here is about uh, using scleral lenses as a management of dry eye. So is increasing volt of a scleral lens uh, effective in ocular surface uh, disease? And if so, yes, what should we do about it? And what should be the contraindication if there's any experience and about that? Any comments on that? OK, so. Um I am not a fan of uh, huge volt increases with scleral lenses because that has an oxygen problem. So the bigger volt you get, the bigger oxygen deficit you get to the cornea. So I still go with a 150 to 200 micron volt, no matter what it is that I'm doing. The thing that will change my eye is you might add something to the bowl. And something that I love doing is we put um, something like Cellulvisc into the bowl of the scleral lens. Um, there's some great um, new things happening around uh, targeted nutrition and trying to get something like that that you can actually put into the bowl. But for now, if you can put a non-preserved, it has to be non-preserved. So that's important. If you're going to do a scleral lens for dry eye, you have to have non-preserved saline, number one. 
then you have to use a non-preserved lubricant drop that you add into your bowl. So half lubricant, half saline. And, and that will really, you will see that will sort out your dry eye problem really, really effectively. In terms of the fit of the scleral lens, nothing else changes much to doing a normal scleral. A uh, volt 150 to 200 micron is perfect. Okay, so you don't prefer to change the volt, it's just like normal and probably just change the volt uh, content. Yeah, that's, yes. that's what I would say. That's just my preference. I know these guys yeah. that increase volt. I, I have a problem with dry eye patients. You have a problem with oxygen as it is. And the moment you go too high, you will get a corneal clouding very quickly. Yep, yep. Okay. So the other question is on, would you prefer to use uh, silicon uh, hydrogel lenses for any dry eye patients? I, I don't. I'm not a soft okay. lens fan. When it comes to dry eye patients, yes, silicon hydrogel will dry out less quickly than a normal hydrogel in a dry eye patient. But when you're looking at dry eye, and, and, and I'm referring here specifically to dry eye disease, so you only treat a dry eye patient with a contact lens um, if it's really kind of more severe. If that's the case, you, you're not going to come right with a soft lens. You want to go straight into a scleral. If it's just dry eye symptoms and the patient is wearing lenses for um, corrective uh, purposes and they have just a little bit of dry eye symptoms, you could probably manage them quite comfortably with a silicon hydrogel lens. But then the silicon hydrogel lens is not a management option. It's not a treatment option for the dry eye. It's a treatment yeah. option for the prescription, right? If it's a dry eye treatment option, you skip soft lenses and you go straight into sclerosis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree to that. It's not a treatment option, but if you mm -hmm. have patients who have symptoms of dry eye with their own lenses, then probably that's uh, one of the yes. options available. That's correct. Uh, agree, the yeah. other question is, yeah, the other question is about tear osmolality, and is there any other test or uh, where, which we with which we can measure the tear osmolality, or just the only osmometer what you were mentioning? As far as I have it, it's only an osmometer that can do osmolarity testing. There are a few different ones on the market. Uh, the one I'm familiar with is the Tear Lab one. Um, and then there's another one, name I can't get to now, uh, the iPen, I think it's called, uh, which is a more um, portable device, but it has to be an osmometer. There's no other machine that can actually measure osmolarity. Okay. Uh... Any comments on the importance of different type of Schemer's tests uh, for dry eye patients? Because we have one without anesthetic, one with anesthetic. So what do you prefer and what's your take on that? Okay, so let's talk about why would you do without and why would you do with. So when you do without anesthetic, you are testing the patient's reflex tearing, the actual reaction to this discomfort. When you do it with anesthetic, you are, you are testing their basal tear production. So when you are actually doing a basic dry eye workup, there's no point of having a reflex tear test. So when I do a workup, I only do anesthetized Schirmer tests because I want to see what the patient's own body capacity is to produce um, aqueous fluid. Because you are going to do it with anesthetic though, it's very important that that is the last Thing you do and um, when I do and uh, when I've taught this before when we go through the workup process you will see exactly where it falls in and the Schirmer test is the last thing you do because that's the one that you will do under anesthetic for me there's no point of doing it non-anesthetized you will do it with anesthetic only okay and uh, I mean as, as we know that you have therapeutic rights and you can use diagnostic drugs uh, would you suggest any other tests for people who probably cannot use uh, uh, anesthetics? So the interesting thing with the research at the moment is that the Schirmer test is kind of being um, dropped out. They're saying that it's very difficult to repeat in normal patients. So the Schirmer test is starting to phase out quite, um, quite quickly. So the TMH, your tear meniscus height, is currently your standard for measuring aqueous production. You can do it under 
a topographer or you can do it under a slit lamp. So how it will work under a slit lamp is you put fluorescein in the eye and it will make that little fluorescein pool of tears at the bottom of the lid. And I literally take a PD rule and get it under the slit lamp as close to the eye as possible. And you can really gauge or it's, it's a bit primitive. You can kind of get an idea of how much fluid you have in that little tear lake lying in the lid there. So you can do that very effectively without having diagnostic drugs or the use of diagnostic drugs. Yeah, true. Yeah. And uh, next question is about uh, any possibility of reoccurrence even after management. So once you have treated uh, according to your experience, uh, how about re reoccurrence? Is there happening in all patients or there is some percentage? Uh, any comments on that? So the big problem with dry eye is it's a chronic issue. Um, dry eye problems are normally systemic, whether it's um, evaporative or aqueous deficient. So as long as the, the systemic problem um, is there, you will always have an ocular surface issue as well. And that's what makes dry eye management so difficult, but so interesting, because you can have the same patient present in three months time with a different situation because their systemic um, environment has changed. They've they're taking new tablets, or now suddenly they have an autoimmune condition that they didn't have before. So, so this is an ongoing thing and a, and a chronic thing with every patient. Very important to have that discussion with your patient is that you must remember that dry eye care is a, a long-term thing. People need to learn to look after their lids, do lid wipes on a daily basis. Otherwise, it's going to keep on coming back in different shapes and forms. But yes, unfortunately, the, the short question of this answer is you are going to always have some form of recurrence. It's going to depend on how well the patient sticks to their treatment plan how stable their dry eye a problem is going to be. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, I think, kind of a connecting question, but do you think there's any permanent treatment for dry eyes? Yeah, that is a difficult one because uh, permanent, uh, and like I just said, permanent is a very difficult word when you link it with dry eye. Um, one of Things I always avoid saying to my patient is that I am going to fix you because I can't fix them. What I want to try and do is I want to try and find the problem and manage the problem as best I can, but it's very difficult to cure dry eye problems. Um, and it's important that your patients understand this. You are going to try your hardest, but it's it, permanent is a very difficult, um, a very difficult solution. You will have patients that have, uh, a, say, for instance, a punctal plug, where uh, a surgeon has put in a punctal plug and said to them, this is going to permanently solve your problems. In six months' time, they come because their eyes are tearing because now there's too much tear fluid, and now you have to remove the plugs because now there's too much tear. So I would stay away from words like permanent and solution and cure when it comes to dry eye. We are mad. Uh, their problem and the, the systemic issues as best as we can to try and make them as comfortable as possible. Yeah, yeah. I think patients counseling plays a very important role. Very. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, any any tips on mebobian glands? So there there are patients who have lost mebobian glands, and is there any treatment modalities or any therapies which you would possibly do or suggest to get to the standard mebobian glands or that's not possible? Okay, so um, again, this is a very complex question and um, I would really suggest that you come and do that three-part training of mine because with mebobian gland, there's, uh, I mean, I can keep you guys busy for six hours when we talk about mebobian glands. Um, but the, the quick answer in this is that once the gland is lost or dropped out, you're not going to regain it. So you want to try and avoid stenosis of the gland. Um, the, the, the main thing is uh, lid wipes or lid hygiene. We need to start training our patients to wash their eyelids like they brush their teeth because the inflammation on the meibomian gland opening is 90% of the problem. After that, 
you can do an in-office lid expression debridement, you can do mybomin gland probing, things like that are really effective in regaining the function of the existing gland. And it's important because the gland has to be existing. Once it's dropped out, you are not going to regain it. So we have to educate patients that we don't want to get to a point where they've lost all their gland structure because at that stage, there's really nothing we can do about it. So try and avoid the dropout, lid wipes, gland expression, gland probing, and then you should be able to keep the gland structure intact. Yeah. And uh, any relationship uh, which you have found between filamentary keratitis and dry eye and any difference uh, in the workup or examination for such patients? <laughs> Okay, so filamentary keratitis is the exact consequence of uh, autoimmune dry eye problem. So what happens with filamentary is that you have uh, no um, aqueous production and the mucin layer and the lipid layer of the tear comes together and that forms these uh, gel balls, which then gets attached to the corneal surface. So this is a direct link to autoimmune aqueous deficiency, all right? Again, the moment you deal with autoimmune conditions, you have to make sure the autoimmune condition is managed first. So if you see a filamentary keratitis patient with no systemic medication, your first thought should be they have to go for an autoimmune blood workup. We have to figure out where the problem lies. Then in terms of um, treatment and workup for this patient, the only I think the only difference here would be um, that you... I would probably still do a basic workup, but you you will you will not have to measure their Schirmer and you will not have to measure their TMH because it's going to be non-existing. You know, you're going to see it very quickly. Their treatment plan is quite different though, because these patients need um, corneal scraping, they need bandage lenses. A lot of times they need a cortisone or um, a immunomodulatory drug. So these patients need to be co-managed. If you can't prescribe them yourself you're going to have to have someone that can help you with this because they're going to have to be on some form of um, autoimmune or immune modulatory drug and systemic medication probably for the rest of their life. And then they do very, very well on um, scleral lenses, on bandaged scleral lenses. They, they, they really function well on that. Yep. And uh, the next question is on, uh, can you also elaborate on how do you actually basic, uh, you know, explain the patients on if there's any environmental modifications they would do to get rid of their symptoms? Is there anything special you do about that? Yeah, so environmental, um, it, 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 there's a few areas. So indoors, outdoors is your two main classifications. Um, indoors is easy to do because you can do it with uh, dehumidifiers um, and making sure they don't sleep with an aircon on or a fan on, things like that. Sometimes the patients you need to look for here are the patients who has things like sleep apnea, who sleeps with oxygen masks. They have a lot of oxygen leaking through the mask into the ocular surface, waking up with a lot of dryness. So in these environments, um, uh, goggles, moisture goggles works really well. You get sleep ones that are soft that they can sleep with that just make sure that their eyes are sealed properly. It, external factors or outdoor factors are harder to manage because these patients, I mean, it's difficult to manage the wind and the sun because you, you can't really manage that well. But these patients will also have to wear sunglasses. You get very good um moisture goggles that wrap around and that kind of seal onto the face that keeps the moisture in um, to the ocular surface. Um, but they need to just be educated to stay away from smoking environments, you know, uh, maybe flames, things like that. Windy days, they're going to really have a battle with these things. But external is a really lot harder to manage than it is indoors. Okay. And we'll take last couple of questions. Uh, any experience on using the Oculus K5 and how do you think the measurements are reliable that helps to measure the TMH, the TBUT? So any experience? I, on that? I am a huge Oculus fan. I have a K4 in my office. I haven't been able to upgrade yet, but I love Oculus. I love the Oculus uh, software as well. The um, 
uh, Genvis Pro software in terms of dry eye is magnificent. It really is a huge, huge help when it comes to diagnosing your patient. And it just puts everything in a nice form for you. And you can actually print it out when you're actually referring a patient back. So um, I'm, I'm a very big fan of the Oculus software, of the Oculus uh, machine itself. Even for normal topography, it really gives you a very, very good um, uh, topo image as well. The one thing you have to just be careful of with the Oculus is that you must make sure that your Oculus surface um, when you're doing a topography, that your surface is wet. Otherwise, your your topo, well, it's actually with all topographers, but then your, your map is going to be a bit off. But when it comes to dry eye, this is really the way to go. I really think you have everything together in one machine that can really help you do this properly. Yep. And there's one last question. This is This is regarding the current scenario, I would say, that everybody now is on digital devices and, you know, people are using... Uh, digital devices for more than four to six hours uh, because of this COVID, work from home, school from home and everything is, is already in place now. So as, as a clinician, uh, what would you advise uh, to do on such patients vis visiting to our practice? So should we do a dry eye assessment straight away or we should wait for their symptoms and uh, how would you go about advising them management options okay so in terms of clinical environment you have to get to a point where you're making life a little bit easier for yourself we don't have the time to have every single discussion with every single patient and if you're going to have the visual strain discussion with every patient you are going to go insane after day one so i have structured pamphlets um, i've got pamphlets on everything I've trained my practice staff to assist me hugely with these things. Give the patients reading material. Let them sit in the waiting room and read certain things that you want them to read instead of a newspaper about the newest shoes or whatever. Give them something educational. So by the time they come into your consult room, they have questions that is applicable to their situation. Yeah can deal with only their questions rather than trying to cover everything in a 30-minute bracket. Um, regarding dry eye testing, I wouldn't do a dry eye test on every single patient because firstly, they are maybe not going to be happy um, about it because they're not there for that purpose. I normally reserve dry eye testing for my symptomatic patients unless I find something clinically significant. Unless during my test I find something that I feel is necessary to discuss, then I'll go there. But if I don't find anything, even though the patient's on the computer for 12 hours a day, I will have the pure discussion of, remember your eyes could get dry, it's not a good idea, take regular breaks, and that's that. And let them get to a point with the information to come back to you and say, okay, listen, I have a problem. But pamphlets, really, guys, pamphlets are your best friend. You really want to save yourself the breath of having these conversations with your patients every day. You want to give it to them in a different form, and you can just spend time on the things that really matter. Train your staff, train your practice team to help with these discussions so that you can spend time on the things that really matter and not waste time on, on discussions that could be left for someone else. Yeah. And would you also incorporate the questionnaire while they are waiting at the waiting area with the leaflet so that you can actually have a score before they walk in or only if they are complaining? I, I, I like doing that because a lot of patients, um, when it comes to dry eye, have kind of, especially women, they kind of have, have, have put their symptoms aside as being normal. So they've kind of gotten to a point where they've deal, dealt with it and they, they, they're not comfortable, but they're kind of okay with it, you know. So I like having a questionnaire done so that the patient can start thinking about, oh, but wait, actually there is something wrong and I shouldn't have to deal with this. And it takes them two minutes extra. It's not a lot of time. I would include it as part of the initial paperwork when they walk in, get everyone to do an OSDI straight off the bat. Yeah, yeah. So I think most of the clinics uh, probably should pr start practicing that as clinicians. Like when your patients are waiting, uh, give them some leaflets and hand out rather than letting them know what are the cases of COVID going on 
uh, reading at the newspaper, right? Uh, let them have educational material um, to read yes, and yes. Uh, you know uh, give them an osdi so when they walk in when you are actually wanting to do your examination you have them provoked with their symptoms and and i think it will save your time as clinician uh, to for go sure. about doing a lot of stuff yeah uh, for sure and that is really and, and to tell you guys that that's really my heart is i want to be available for you guys and support I have already structured leaflets and pamphlets. I have a whole pamphlet pack available. Um, I'm going to be making it available on GuruMed very soon as well um, to save you the time of going to go and restructuring pamphlets. So I've done all the work. They are going to be available really soon. That includes a dry eye management record card um, as well. So it really will save a lot of time. So please keep an eye on the website. I will have these things available very soon. Yeah. And also on Facebook, I think people can do follow you on Facebook uh, on your yes. Guru Med page. So that can directly link because I think most of us are Facebook fans and people yes. would rather go to the Facebook and then link to your website if if there's any problems in the links. So please feel free to do that. And there is a loads of information there, as ma'am has already mentioned. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for again uh, enlightening us. And I think I saw some comments that uh, an inspirational talk that we would get started to do dry eye management. So things like this are very important uh, when it comes to uh, we as clinicians. So thank you very much for taking up this time and helping us uh, to do this. Thank you very much for having me, giving me the opportunity. And I, like I said, I'd really love to see you guys walk into this. So thank, thank you very you. much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, ma'am, for taking up this time. Uh, quite a few of announcements we do have sessions next week uh, so please stay tuned to your emails the whatsapp groups and all the social medias we will be posting up uh, the details of the next sessions on the next weekend and a bit of a reminder so anybody who is interested to present any case studies uh, we are in the process of starting case presentation series so watch out onto your emails, uh, which will take you to the Google form where you can submit complete abstracts, which will help us to prepare your schedule for case presentation. So thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you, ma'am, for your time. And I hope uh, I'll see you all next week. Stay home, stay safe, and take care. Bye-bye.